Hello, everyone. My name is Will. I am one of the pastors here at New Life Press, and we are continuing along in a series where we're taking a look at various miracles in the Bible and helping and hoping to see what does the power of God in the presence of modern-day 21st century people today mean for us as disciples. And we are in our second week. We're going to take a look at a miracle that's a little bit esoteric, but it comes to us in Mark chapter 2. And so if you are able, I want to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. We do this out of a a reverence, a respect uh, for the reading of His Word. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. I pray that your hearts and minds would be open here today. So Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And when we turned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there is no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in a spirit that they questioned, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And this is God's word. You can take your seats. By the way, the last phrase of the passage in verse 12 in which it said they were amazed, we never saw anything like this. In some ways, is the hope and dream of every message that when we get a crystal clear picture of the gospel of Jesus, we reflect to ourselves, that was pretty amazing. The Son of God coming down and forgiving us. Well, we're in our series, Our Great Healer, where we're taking a look at the great physician and trying to understand... How does the power of God work in the presence of people today? Or one way to think about this, you look at all these miracles that agnostics and atheists would reject because it defies the laws of physics and science, and we think to ourselves, what do the miracles of God in the Bible mean in the man of Jesus today? How is it practical for the everyday experiences of disciples like you and me living in Southern California. And that's what we're trying to do in this series, to say, if you want to be healed, if you want to be restored in life, one of the ways you could do this is by understanding the miracles of God in the man of Jesus and applying that very practically in your life today. And so we look at this miracle. It's pretty clear what the miracle is. Jesus, here's a paralytic, somebody who may be a quadriplegic, and we're going to see what does that miracle mean for you and I today. And I want to attack this by looking at this miracle from three perspectives, three angles, three heart issues, three types of people that represents three types of people here today. So first, when we look at this miracle, we can understand the power of God in the presence of people by looking at the crowds. Jesus is preaching. There's a crowd in his home. What do the crowds tell us about the spiritual condition of people today? Secondly, we'll look at the paralytic. What did Jesus really do in this man's life that is so profound and miraculous that at the end of verse 12, people say, we never saw anything like this before. And then thirdly, we're going to consider the scribes who are sort of the professors of Jesus' day. The scribes were the educated. Sometimes they were in positions of power. They were experts in the law. They were the academics. They were learned they were successful. And what does Jesus say to them? How does Jesus prove them wrong? And what does that mean for the scribes who are sitting in the pews here today? Or maybe even my heart as well. 
So we're going to look at this, and hopefully you could glean a little bit of who Jesus is. But let's consider first the crowds in Jesus' miracle. Now, we didn't read this, but the Gospel of Mark begins Jesus' ministry. Mark's particular writing style is that he likes to talk about action. So when he writes the narrative of the Gospel of Mark, it's really quick. From miracle to miracle, teaching to teaching, from one success story after the other, it's really quick, it's fast-paced, it's a little bit hectic, frenetic, rigid. And in chapter 1, he heals a leper, and then he says to the leper, don't tell anyone what I've done. And what does the leper do? He goes out and tells everyone what Jesus has done for him. And then you come to chapter 2 in our passage, and that's why there's a crowd, because if anybody could heal a leper, everybody's going to come to either see it or to receive it. And that's what we have here in our context. Jesus returns back to Capernaum. It tells us he's at home. Most likely it's Simon Peter's home. It was packed. There was no more room. There wasn't even an entryway into the door. And so what did Jesus do? Well, he did what he normally did. He began preaching about the kingdom. That was his main ministry. So don't miss the fact that as many miracles as Jesus has done, his main ministry, his bread and butter, the meat and potatoes of what he's about was about teaching and preaching. One commentator by the name of James Edwards has said this about the ministry of Jesus. So essential is the proclamation of the gospel to Jesus, his purpose, that Mark can subsume his entirety, his entire ministry in the phrase, he preached the word to them. Now that's a subtle note, but that's something that you and I can consider because it tells us that Christianity is so different from every other religion. Every other religion, in some form or fashion, is about moralism or performance or good works, about a set of values that you have to live up to so that if you do good enough, you get a reward, you get a blessing. Christianity is the only one that says, yes, we care about action, but the fundamental perspective of Christianity is a message. Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom is. This is what I came to do. It's about a message about what Jesus has done not first about a set of moral standards that you're required to do. So it's completely different from every other system of thought, religiosity, philosophy, that at the end of the day is some form or fashion about moralism or actions. So even with this crowd, they want to see some sort of action or miracle, but what does Jesus do? He's always just teaching. He's explaining. He's preaching. Because it's not just about good works. It's about truth and forgiveness. That's why Christianity is so fundamentally different from everything out there in the world. So at least we can consider this is what Christianity on its own terms can offer you. A preaching, a message, a truth about forgiveness and grace. Jesus is preaching the word to the crowds, but here's the irony in comparison. He's in a small little house. So what does this tell us about crowds? What are you supposed to learn? Mark is a wonderful writer. He's contrasting the public ministry of Jesus to crowds and the intimate ministry of the house. And we see both of those converge in the second miracle. He's preaching to the crowds. It's so packed, you can't get in, but it's in the intimacy of the house. Even in the Greek, there is an alliteration between the word crowd as well as house. It's oklos and oikos. And that's the contrast that I think Mark wants us to understand. Are you the oklos or are you the oikos? Are you like the crowds? Or are you like Jesus' house? And this is what we're supposed to learn about this. Read with me again verses 1 to 2. It sets up this contrast between the crowds in the house, the oklos, and the oikos. So verse 1 and 2, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And when there were many were gathered together so that there is no room, no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. So they're in his home. It's a house. But there were many gathered together. Verse 4 later later says it's a crowd. Crowds play an important role in the Gospel of Mark. We see that for Mark, Jesus is famous. He's popular. But Mark refers to crowds nearly 40 times before he gets to chapter 10. The crowds are an essential character in the Gospel of Mark. But what's interesting is that when you look at crowds and you listen to what Mark writes about crowds, this is what we learn about crowds. They listen to Jesus' teaching. They receive Jesus' compassion. But crowds are never described 
as repenting and believing and following after Christ. Actually, the singular most important factor and attribute, the common attribute of crowds in the Gospel of Mark, their function in Mark's Gospel are that crowds block access to Jesus. That's the ock loss. Large crowds, in other words, tell us fame and popularity was not the measure of Jesus' success. Because on one level, Jesus was the most unsuccessful evangelist there was because no one ever got converted. They actually hated him and eventually killed and crucified him. In fact, crowds usually implied to us to be the outsiders. Crowds are those presented by Mark to be passive, ambivalent, apathetic. Crowds are those people who are a little bit entertained. Crowds for today are people who go to church on Easter and Christmas, but never again, and it makes no difference in their everyday lives. That's the crowds. They have no real desire to follow Jesus. They do this out of routine, out of tradition. They do this out of intrigue. It's temporary. It's fleeting. It's never life-changing. It's not deep. It doesn't change them at their hearts. That's the function of the crowds. And part of the challenge for you and I is to ask ourselves, am I part of the loss? Am I like the crowd? You come here and you could worship. You're sort of, this is what I've grown up with. When it's convenient and fits in my schedule, I'll just show up. And by being present, sort of close, like the crowds were with Jesus, hearing this message, witnessing this miracle, you're just sort of in proximity to Jesus, you assume you're united to the person of Jesus. But that's not really what crowds are about. They're, they're nominal. They're thin. They're apathetic, and they're ambivalent. But in contrast to this, the oikos, the house, are more intimate settings where Jesus gave special instruction and explanation to disciples and insiders. In the house, in the privacy of intimacy, is where we see Jesus explaining things really clear to the people, to the people who follow him, love him, would die for him, his inner circle. So the question again is, are you in the crowd or are you in the house? Are you in the oklos or the oikos? The contrast between the house and the crowd in verses 1 to 2 tell us a simple and profound point of application. It means that you could be excited for Jesus. You could be kind of close to Jesus in proximity, but never be a follower of Jesus. You can get excited about Christ. You can get emotional and enthusiastic about Christ for a season, but you never get into routine discipleship with Christ. I mean, it's almost as if Years ago, I used to always preach at this denominational retreat when I was in youth ministry back in New Jersey. And I remember doing this three times at the same kid, every retreat, on the last night of the retreat. Or if you've grown up in retreats, you know the last night is when miracles happen because you get emotional and you cry. You turn off the lights and everyone prays with each other at night. This one kid, every time, every year, says, I'm going to get saved tonight. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. You follow up later and it goes back to school. And it's back to daily life if Jesus made no difference. I can't peer into the kid's heart, but that's more like an awk loss. That's a crowd. Real discipleship applies the gospel in the everyday parts of your lives. About work, your money, your marriage, your parenting, your school, your friends, your social media. You struggle and you work out, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, to be the house? Jesus never says in the gospels, I'm building crowds today. Jesus always says, I will build my house because that's the true church of Jesus. That's his followers. That's the point about the crowds. But secondly, let's look at the paralytic. The paralytic. In verse 3, we read this. And they came, bringing him to him a paralytic carried by four men. These men were not part of the crowd. They came in after the crowd was formed. These four men are probably the oikos, the house. They show us that they're different. The crowd, they stand, they observe. What do the disciples do? And this is a poetic contrast. They're always moving. It's really what James says, faith without works is dead. 
And it shows us this contrast. Those who are nominal in the awe clause, they stand, they observe, they take in, they get entertained. But the disciples, those who really follow Jesus, the house, the oikos, they're moving. They come into the house. There's no opening. They, they're, ten, they're tenacious. They go onto the roof. They dig up a hole because houses back then, the roofs were made of grass or some sort of agriculture and mud, so you could easily dig it up. And they drop their friend down. Why? Because they're moving. And that's what Mark wants you to show, to show you. The oikos, the disciples, move quickly. They're, they put into action. I mean, it was crowded. They couldn't get near to Jesus. Now, if you can imagine the situation, Jesus is preaching, crowds are gathered around him, they're listening, they're observing, and then all of a sudden, you see this guy who's a paralytic on some sort of mattress or bed being dropped down by his four friends. Now, what would you do if you were Jesus? Man, don't interrupt my sermon. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm getting really good. I'm, this is, I'm getting to the climax. Jesus doesn't get annoyed. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't say, hey, you're not, too, you're not good and important enough for me to talk and to converse with you. What does he do? He looks at the paralytic. Obviously, he knows what the man needs. He looks at the faith of the four friends, and later on, he begins to sense the grumbling heart of the scribes. What does he do? My son, your sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus does in verse 5. He saw their actions probably as a genuine demonstration of faith. When Jesus saw their faith, saw their actions, the crowds are watching, the scribes are grumbling, and he forgives the sins. You know what's so surprising and complex about this miracle? And this is a lesson for you and I to learn. The paralytic comes for healing, but Jesus gives forgiveness. Now, if you were the paralytic, you want to be healed. You want to walk. And if Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, you may be thinking, I don't want that. I, I've got to heal my body. I want to walk. I want to run. I want to play basketball. I want to jog. I don't want to be dependent on four friends. I want to carry somebody else on my back. So he comes in to get physical healing, but Jesus gives him, what does he give? He gives him spiritual healing. That's how Jesus sees this. The guy wants to walk, but he gets something bigger and better. This is a lesson, friends. In the paradigm and the economics of the kingdom in Christianity, sometimes your most urgent need is not your greatest need. When Jesus obviously sees his most urgent need in the paralytic, but he addresses his most desperate need to be right with God, to have your sins forgiven, to receive eternal salvation. The paralytic comes to Jesus what, with what he wants, but Jesus gives him what he really needs. If I could ask you here today, what is your greatest need in life? What is your greatest needs? Maybe it's friends. Maybe it is healing. Maybe it's a better job, healthier marriage, more successful kids. For youth group, for students, you may be thinking cooler parents, more understanding parents, more present parents, more involved parents. All of that is so important to Jesus' heart. He sees your suffering. He's honest about life. But even then, and I know this is a little bit sensitive, even then, and as much of suffering as you go through, and that's real and that's honest, and Jesus cares about that, even then, the paradigm is that your greatest need is inside of you, forgiveness of sins, and not outside of you. Many of us think that our greatest need and our greatest problem is outside of us. It's our circumstances. It's the weather. It's the community we live in. Those are real understandable issues. But at a fundamental, most basic level, our greatest need and our greatest problem is not something outside of us, but inside of us. Our sinful hearts, the restlessness that we have, a need for reconciliation, a hope and peace. We need something that gives us a sense of peace of life, a balance in life, a joy in life, a reconciled life. The greatest fundamental need that you and I have is not outside of us, but inside of us. And we need to recognize that our greatest need, forgiveness of sins, our greatest problem, our rebellion against God, is something that's inside of us, that will lead to something outside of us. See, friends, it's not just not a, a Christian 
That's not a Christian paradigm. I, I think non-believers get that too, if you really look into this. Now, I'm dating myself a little bit, but the reason I know that also non-Christians understand that fundamentally the greatest problem that people have is something internal and not external is from a movie, one of my favorites from 1984, The Karate Kid. <laughs> You may have seen the younger of you, the younger folks, Cobra Kai on Netflix, pretty good too. But it's more nostalgia for guys like me that grew up watching The Karate Kid. The crane kick, put him in a body bag, you know, Johnny Lawrence, it's amazing. Now, you don't have to know the movie in order to understand the illustration. This kid, The Karate Kid, played by Ralph Macchio, grows up in a poor neighborhood in California, moves over to a newer city with his mom, meets his Japanese karate teacher in a an apartment complex, Mr. Miyagi, gets bullied at school, is trying to figure out life, he's getting beat up, he doesn't have a dad, he doesn't have a relationship, he's not successful at school. Everything in his life seems to be going awry and imploding. He wants to just be happy. He likes to call this, because he learned it from Mr. Miyagi, I want balance. That's their version of saying gospel, I want peace, I want coherence in life, I want to have a perspective in which life can thrive and I can be happy. So he learns karate to overtake the bullies in his school. They go to this national tournament, which is amazing because he only trains like eight months, and all of a sudden he's as good as a grandmaster who's got black belts. Goes to the final match, but then they play a dirty move on him, kick out his knee. He's in the locker room. He's about to forfeit. And then you have one of the most iconic points in the movie in which, in which Mr. Miyagi goes to the karate kid. And Ralph Macchio, Danny LaRusso, he says, I got to, can, can you heal me? He's a paralytic on the mattress. Can you heal me? I got to try. I got to fight. And he says, why, why do you care so much? You don't need the, the gold medal. You don't need to be the championship. Because he says, no, it's not that. Because if I don't fight, I'll never find balance in my life. I'll never have balance with my mom, my girlfriend, with those guys who are bullying me. Even then, it shows us what that kid is looking for is a balance in life. That's what I like to call a gospel moment. It's not about healing his knee. It's about finding balance. And Jesus is saying, as a paralytic walks in, he's saying, I know you want to walk, but I'm going to give you something better. And friends, that's what you and I need to learn today. Yes, pray for everything. Jesus sees where you are, but your greatest need is not always your most urgent need. Your most desperate fundamental need is not always going to be your felt need. And unless you realize that the greatest problem you have is this sin and the fractured relationship with God the Father, you'll never have what the karate kid wanted, balance. You just won't get it. And that's why Jesus says, my son, your sins are forgiven. That's why Jesus says that to the paralytic sees what his urgent need is, but addresses his greatest need. And this leads us to our last and final point. If you look at the scribes, it's this hearing of forgiveness which shifts the narrative over to the scribes. Now, the scribes, if you didn't understand this, are the experts in the law. They're the professors. They're the academics. They're the learned. Sometimes they're in the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish body of power. So they're, they're, they have success in their status. So many of us, especially in Orange County, may relate to the scribes because what they care about and what they have in society is that they're learned and they have status. They have influence. Now look at with me verses 6 to 7. It says there, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Now, you can understand this from a Jewish perspective. Jesus was saying, I'm God. I can forgive your sins. But Jewish people are like, only God can forgive sins. Even in teaching and miracles, Jesus is demonstrating that he is God himself. And therefore, he says, I forgive your sins. The scribes are slow to get it. So they don't understand what's going on. They're blaspheming. They're, they're grumbling. They're critical. And then be, they begin to crucify him later on in the gospel. See, the reason the scribes were so disgruntled is because Jesus, in saying that the sins of the paralytic were given, was claiming to be God. That's why it's blaspheming. No one can forgive sins except God. 
The scribes never claimed to forgive sins. The priests in the Old Testament, they only mediated the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus makes an absolute statement and pretends, and in reality actually is, saying to them, when you sin, you're sinning against me because I am God. I have the authority. He was authorized to forgive sins. And then the scribes claim it was utter blasphemy. Are there any scribes here today, not just talking about professors of higher education, the scribes represent to you and me those who are critical, those who are entitled, those who are grumbling, those who are upset, those who are never happy, those who look at the blessings for people who are less privileged but think they're better than those who are less privileged. That's what the scribes represent. They represent people who are educated, the commentators will note that the reason the scribes are so blind to their sin is because of education and status, which prevents them from seeing their ultimate need. Here's the beauty about the Gospel of Mark in this passage. I entitled the message, The Healing of the Paralytic, but there's actually two paralytics here. The physical paralytic and the scribes who are the spiritual paralytics. There's two types of paralysis here, and Jesus will show us he has the power to heal both. The scribes are no less dependent upon Jesus for forgiveness, no less in need to find that balance internally inside out. But it's their learning, their status, which makes them blind to their need. The condition of the scribes, friends, is probably something along the lines of education, success, learning, elitism, And that's why he asks one of the hardest questions in verse 9 to prove to the scribes that he actually is the son of God. In verses 9 to 10, this is what we see. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is the point. This is the climax of the situation. He forgives the paralytic the sins, And if you can imagine Jesus for a moment, this is the amazing thing. This is why he's the son of God. You have this crowd. He's preaching the word. The paralytic drops in. He looks up. You have an urgent need, but I'm going to address your most desperate need. Son, your sins are forgiven. But Jesus being the son of God, he already is hearing the pulsating heart of the criticality of the scribes' hearts. And it's almost as if he turns to the scribes and says, what did you say? But they never articulate anything. He senses the heart. That's how honest Christianity is. For those of you who are critical in your heart, judgmental, elitist, just because you don't say it, because you're smiling in public, doesn't mean that Jesus, he doesn't sense that heart. And he says, okay, I'm going to prove it to you. You want to play this game? All right, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins, I'm going to show you I have the authority to heal this man. So he says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And what does the guy do? He rises, which I don't know what the experience of that man would have been like, takes up his bed and walks. And he proves to the crowds and proves to the scribes that he is the son of man who has the authority to forgive sins because he proved it through healing this paralytic. In other words, he wants to show the people he's just not a healer, but that he's a savior. Look at verse 12. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. An amazing miracle. This is the the double meaning of this miracle. You think the real miracle is going to be healing the physicality of the paralytic, but Mark wants us to know the real miracle is the Son of God came down to get his hands dirty in our lives and forgives our sins. They were all amazed. Did you know that humans naturally gravitate towards the amazing We gravitate towards the transcendent. We want something that's mind-blowing and breathtaking. You want to experience and see something that's amazing. Do you know how I know this? Because a guy by the name 
of Rusty McAllister once told me so that humans want amazing. Do you know who Rusty McAllister is? He's a side minor character little kid in the original Disney, The Incredibles. You remember that movie, The Incredibles, the Parr family? They're a superhero family, but the tension and the tone of culture has turned negative against superheroes, so the Parr family has to go into hiding, pretend they're an everyday, normal kind of family. The head of the family, Mr. Incredible, Bob Parr, is frustrated with this, he used to go out at night with Frozone and listen on the radio, and they would do miraculous feats of, of saving and criminal, criminal justice because he wanted to be who he really was, a superhero, but he's living this nine-to-five job. He goes back after work on one day, drives his car into the driveway. He's angry. He's frustrated. He gives a sigh of aggravation. He gets out of his car, slams the door, and then he sees this little kid with a hat who probably is across the street riding his tricycle on the sidewalk. His name is supposed to be Rusty McAllister. And then he looks to the kid and says, what are you waiting for? Little kid responds, I don't know, something amazing, I guess. At the heart of what that little kid is saying is that the human condition naturally, made in the image of God, wants something amazing, don't you? Don't you want to see something amazing? And the gospel of Mark is trying to show you the real amazing miracle is not that the man got up and took his bed and walked physically, but that when Jesus forgave this man's sin, he was forgiven. See, when the paralytic rose and took up his bed, it's supposed to be a picture of the resurrection. But the real miracle is that the man, the paralytic, didn't rise physically. He was resurrected from his sin. And not only does he just rise and walk with his bed, but now he's able to rise and walk with God in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine this as we come to a close. You're the paralytic. There's not a lot of information about this guy. I don't know if he was a quadriplegic. I'm going to assume so, I guess, because he's on a bed. I mean, you're lying in your bed. You can't get up and walk. There's no entertainment. There's no smartphones. There's no iPads. What does a guy do all day? He can't work. His life is at stake. He can't even provide for himself. And he's lying on his bed, and all of a sudden, this leper comes by from chapter 1 and starts telling this guy named Jesus, heal me my leprosy in a miraculous way, right away, what would you do if you're the paralytic? Your eyes are going to widen up. What's his name again? Jesus, he said. I wonder if he could heal me. His four friends come around, and by the way, the four friends who lift up the paralytic, if I ever did a seminar or a Bible study on true friendships, the real heroes of the story on the human level are the four friends. They wanted to get their friend healed. These are the guys who are the real heroes of the story. And he paralytic goes to his four friends, hey, do you guys think you could help me find this guy, Jesus? Maybe I have a chance. This is my chance to walk. I could get healed. And they said, hey, guess what? Hey, I hear Jesus, he's over at his home in Peter's house, and he's preaching, he's teaching about something called the kingdom, but maybe we could bring you over there and try to get you healed. So they lift up their friend, four of them, they walk over, however long that was, over to Simon Peter's house, they realize, oh my goodness, there's a large crowd here. You know, it's like the first time I went to Disneyland, I rode Rise of the Resistance. I went there, and the crowd was just ginormous, and the line was out the door. That was probably the way it was when Jesus was preaching. The four friends are like, okay, let's not have that stop us. Let's go up onto the roof. Who cares what he's teaching about? They dig a hole into the roof, take the mud and the grass out, and they lower the paralytic down. And you're the paralytic, and you're saying, what in the world is going on? I hope this works. Please heal me of my paralysis. And then you hear from Jesus himself, son, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take every bed, and walk. I don't know. Something amazing, I guess. If you're a believer in Jesus and you have your sins forgiven, you accepted Christ, you are something amazing. 
I guess, because of the forgiving, sacrificial death of Jesus, that you are reconciled to God. The crowds don't really care about him. The paralytic on one level was using him. The scribes wanted to kill him, but Jesus wanted to forgive them. And he wants to meet their greatest and most urgent need in life, which is forgiveness of sins. We want to have balance. We want to experience the miracle. Turn away from your sins and turn your life to Christ, who has given his life for you. Why don't we do that now? Let's bow our heads and turn to Jesus in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much just for, Lord, recording a picture of Jesus for us, your son, recorded in the book of eternity so that we can see the glory and splendor of Christ, his teaching, his forgiveness for us. Lord, I pray for our church, those who have walked with you for so long. May they continue to grow in Christ through repentance and forgiveness to look at Jesus as our great healer. I also pray for some of us here who may be attending who are a little bit skeptical, have questions about Christianity. I pray for those who may not be a believer or a Christian, may even have a hard time with this message, that maybe you would touch their hearts as well as a great healer. Lord, we thank you so much for forgiving us, and we ask that you may bless us, and may we sing these songs to you. Thank you so much, God, and we pray this in Jesus Christ. Amen.